Hello, my name is Brian Locke. I am an attorney for the Federal Labor Relations Authority in the Atlanta office. Today, I will be discussing formal discussions, investigative interviews, and bypasses. After completing this session, if you have any further questions, you may wish to visit our website at the FLRA.gov to review authority decisions or the Office of General Counsel case law outline. The first subject we're going to discuss is formal discussions. It is important to remember that unions, as the exclusive representatives of all unit employees, are allowed to participate in formal discussions to protect the interests of bargaining employees and the interests of the union. According to the Federal Service Labor Management Relations Statute, an exclusive representative of an appropriate unit in an agency shall be given the opportunity to be represented at any formal discussion between one or more representatives of the agency and one or more employees in the union concerning any grievance or any personnel policy or practices or any general condition of employment. That's what the statute says, but what does that mean in plain English? Well, it can be broken down into five parts. First, was there, a form, was there a discussion? Second, was there at least one agency representative present at the meeting? Third, did the subject matter of the meeting concern a grievance or a personnel policy or other general condition of employment? Fourth, was the meeting formal? And fifth, did the union receive sufficient advance notice to designate a representative of its choice? So now we're going to discuss each one of those questions in more detail. The first two questions are pretty simple to answer and issues only come up very rarely. First, was there a discussion? Many, discussion, many communications are discussions, including meetings where managers simply take an announcement and employees are not allowed to, to respond. A little later, we're going to discuss what, whether those discussions are actually formal. An agency representative is any individual that is acting on behalf of the agency. It does not have to be a supervisor or even an employee of the agency. For example, it can be a contract EEO investigator, an attorney from the Judge Advocate General, a contractor receiving, providing EAP services. The third question is whether the matter discussed during the meeting is related to a grievance personnel policy, or general condition of employment. Any one of these is sufficient. This is called the subject matter requirement. This issue comes up very frequently. I will start with what a grievance is. Most of you are probably familiar with the negotiated grievance procedure. However, the term grievance has been defined very broadly by the authority as any complaint by any employee concerning a matter related to the employment of the employee. It, can, would, it would also include complaints filed by employees, the union, or the agency regarding contract interpretation or an alleged violation of the law, rule, or regulation affecting conditions of employment. Therefore, it's not just the subjects covered by the negotiated grievance procedure. In fact, a meeting concerning an EEO, MSPB, ULP or OSC complaint would be a grievance under the authority case law. However, a discussion about a grievance or a complaint filed by a supervisor or a non-employee, like a customer for example, is not considered a grievance because they are not employees under the statute. A personnel policy is a general rule that applies to agency employees, not a single action that an agency takes with respect to an individual employee. A general condition of employment concerns general conditions affecting employees in the unit as a whole. The definitions are pretty similar. It's very important to remember that the generally discussions that relate to only a single employee are not discussions concerning personnel policies or general conditions of employment. Of course, a conversation with a single employee may be a form of discussion if the subject concerns the bargaining unit as a whole rather than just a single employee. 
Also, if the meeting concerns a grievance, as we've discussed above, then it doesn't matter if it just involves a single employee. Now let's discuss some examples. First, I'm going to read an example and you decide whether you think the meeting meets the subject matter requirement. First, a step two grievance meeting. Does this meet the subject matter requirement? Yes, a step two grievance meeting concerns a grievance. Remember, it doesn't matter that it involves a single employee. Number two, a counseling session between an employee and his or her supervisor. The answer is no, this does not meet the subject matter requirement. The supervisor may be discussing an agency's policy, but the focus is on the particular employee, not the employees in general. Therefore, it does not meet the subject matter requirement. Number three, interview to prepare for an arbitration or ULP per hearing. Yes, and arbitration and ULP hearings are both based on grievances, on complaints by an employee about their conditions of employment. A meeting held to try to resolve an employee's EEO complaint, where EEO matters are specifically in excluded from the bargaining agreement's grievance procedure. Yes, remember, the statute defines grievances broadly to include any complaint by any employee. We're not focused on the negotiated grievance procedure. And an EEO complaint is a complaint by an employee regarding their conditions of employment. Number five, a meeting to discuss policies and procedures concerning annual leave. Yes, remember the purpose of the statute provision the union should have a right to represent its interests and the interests of employees in general. However, a meeting with an individual employee to tell him that he's not complying with the policy does not meet the subject matter requirement because it's just focused on that one employee. Finally, what about a meeting to discuss a supervisor's conduct and, the impact and its impact on the atmosphere of the office? Yes. Why? Because supervisors can have a profound impact on the workplace. The union would certainly have an interest if the agency decided that it needed to have a meeting to discuss how a supervisor's conduct was imp impacting the workplace environment. Here are the answers to those questions for your records. The fourth question is whether the meeting is formal. Again, the issue comes up very often. There is no statutory definition of formal. Instead, the authority considers the facts of every case and decides whether the meeting is formal. The authority has considered several factors when it determines whether discussion is formal. This, the level of First, the level of, of the supervisor or management officials present. A meeting is more likely to be formal if a very high level management official attends the meeting. Number two, whether other supervisors or management officials attend the meeting. Meetings with multiple supervisors or management officials are more likely to be formal. Number three, how long the meeting lasted. Very long te meetings tend to be formal. Number four, how the meeting was called. If the supervisor verbally invited the employees to the meeting, it is more likely to be informal. How far in advance was the meeting scheduled? Unplanned meetings are more likely to be informal, while a meeting scheduled a week in advance is more likely to be formal. The location of the meeting. A meeting at the employee's workstation is more likely to be informal, while a meeting that's 30 miles away at the agency's headquarters is more likely to be formal. Whether notes were taken or a record was made of the meeting. A meeting is more likely to be formal if the agency takes meeting minutes or if it plans to report the results to upper management. Number eight, whether the meeting was mandatory. If the employees are not required to attend the meeting, it is more likely to be informal. Also ask yourself were the employees asked to sign in. Number nine, the subject matter of the meeting is very important. 
The meeting must be about a grievance, personnel, policy, or practice, or general condition of employment. We've already discussed those. However, a meeting to discuss something which is likely to have a, greatly, have a great impact on employees, such as an upcoming RIF, reduction in force, lends support to a discussion being formal, even where other formality factors are lacking. Finally, kind of a catch-all phrase, the manner in which the meeting is conducted. It is very important to remember that these are merely a list of factors that the authority will consider when determining whether a meeting is formal. There is no requirement that a certain factor be present in every case or that a minimum number of factors be present in every case. There may be situations where only one or two factors are present, but those factors are so strong that the meeting is considered a formal discussion. For example, announcements of very important changes or meetings to discuss litigation of unfair labor practice charges, equal employment opportunity complaints, merit systems protection board complaints, or the OSC complaints. Let's discuss some examples. Again, I will read the example and you decide whether you think the fact supports a finding of a formal discussion. First, the agency director holds the meeting. This is more likely to be formal because the agency director is likely a high-level management official. Number two, four management officials attend the meeting. Again, this is more likely to be formal. The meeting lasts five minutes. This is more likely to be informal. Careful though, length is only one factor. Even short meetings can be formal discussions and long meetings may not be formal discussions. Number four, employees were notified of the meeting two weeks in advance by written memo. This is more likely to be formal. The employees received written notice and it was scheduled very far in advance. The meeting took place in the hallway by the employee's cubicle. More likely to be informal. Employees did not have to leave their workstations to hear the conversation. Number six, an agenda was passed out during the meeting. This is likely to be formal because they took the time to prepare an agenda and wanted to make sure it was well organized. Number seven, a secretary prepared meeting minutes. Again, this is more likely to be formal. If the meeting is important enough to be documented, it's probably a formal meeting. Finally, the meeting was an open-ended dialogue between employees and managers. This is more likely to be informal because the manager did not come to the meeting with a plan to discuss a specific issue. Also, even when a discussion starts out informally, it, is all, it can always change to a formal discussion depending on what the manager says to the employees during the meeting. Here are the answers to those questions. Now we're going to talk about advance notice. If the meeting is a formal discussion, the union is entitled to advance notice. What does that mean? First, it must have enough notice that it can make a decision about whether to attend. Also, it must have enough time to designate the representative to attend the meeting. In most cases, the agency will give the union formal notice. However, there are situations where the agency does not notify the union, but the union learns about the meeting from an employee or from some other source. In that case, the union has actual notice. If the union has actual notice, notice but chooses not to attend, even though it could have, then the agency has not violated the statute. Of course, the union must have enough time to arrange a representative of its choice to attend the meeting. Let's have an exercise to see if you understand this. A manager sends an email to all of his employees announcing that he's going to have a meeting to discuss new leave procedures. 
The union steward receives this email because he is an employee in the department. No other union official was provided notice of the meeting, and the meeting was a formal discussion. Has the agency violated the statute? The answer is yes. The union had a right to de designate its own representative. By giving the notice to the steward as an employee of the department, the agency had not satisfied its obligations under the statute. The agency does not get to determine which union representative will attend the meeting or whether the union will attend the meeting. Here's the answer. What are the union's rights during the formal discussion? The union has a right to comment, speak, and make statements during the formal discussions. However, it cannot take control of the meeting and it must respect orderly procedures. Therefore, it cannot try to discuss a completely unrelated subject or try to prevent the agency from discussing the issue at all. The next subject we're going to talk about is investigatory examinations. These are also called Weingarten investigations. According to Section 7114A2B, the union is entitled to attend any examination of an employee in the union by a representative of the agency in connection with an investigation if the employee reasonably, reasonably believes that the examination may, may result in disciplinary action against the employee and the employee requests representation. Again, let's break that down into different parts. There are four questions. Was there an agency representative? Was there an examination in connection with an investigation? Did the employee have a reasonable anticipation of discipline? And did the employee request union representation? We've already discussed what an agency representative means. So the next question is whether the meeting is an examination. An examination is any meeting where an employee agency representative tries to get information from an employee, including admitting or denying any wrongdoing. It does not have to be a formal investigation. Even meetings that are called informal fact findings can be examinations. The third question is whether the employee had a reasonable anticipation of discipline. Would a reasonable employee be concerned that they would be disciplined? If an employee is being questioned about wrongdoing, he or she probably has a reasonable anticipation of discipline even if the supervisor does not specifically tell the employee that he or she is being investigated for wrongdoing. The manager doesn't know what is in the employee's head, and the employee may believe he or she has done something wrong. It is also important to note that we don't consider what the employee actually thought. Instead, we focus on what a reasonable person would have thought in that, cons in that situation. Finally, the employee must request representation. The employee does not have to use any particular specific or magic words. The authority will look at all the facts and circumstances to determine whether the employee wanted representation. Remember, in formal discussions, the employee does not have to request union representation. It is the agency's responsibility to notify the union in advance of formal discussions. However, in investigatory examinations, the employee must make the request. Why the difference? Remember, the purpose of the formal discussion is to represent employees in general, not just to re represent a particular employee. Therefore, the union, not the employee, decides whether the union should attend a formal discussion. However, in investigatory examinations, the union attends the meeting to protect the interests of the individual employee not the bargaining unit in general. Therefore, the employee gets to decide whether he wants the union's protections.
Let's try an exercise. A supervisor calls an employee into his office to tell him that he has not been following the correct procedures for requesting leave. The employee requests union representation before the meeting, but the supervisor says no. During the meeting, the supervisor warns the employee that if he fails to follow the proper procedure for requesting leave one more time, he will be disciplined. The supervisor then tells the employee he can leave. Did the supervisor violate the statute? Remember to ask yourself each one of the four questions. Let's discuss the answer. First, is there an agency representative? Yes, the supervisor. Did the employee have a reasonable anticipation of discipline? Yes. The supervisor warned the employee that he would be disciplined if he did it again. Was there an examination? No. The supervisor did not ask the employee any questions or ask him to say anything. Did the employee request union representation? Yes, he asked the question before the meeting, but that still counts. So did the supervisor violate the statute? No. All four questions must be true if there is to be an investigatory examination. In this case, the supervisor didn't ask the employee any questions, so there was no examination. Therefore, there was no Weingarten investigation. Another exercise. An employee is called into the manager's office for what the manager calls a counseling session. The employee is questioned about her use of abusive language in the workplace. The employee leaves after explaining what happened. Did the agency violate the statute? First, is there an agency representative? Yes. Did the employee have a reasonable anticipation of discipline? Yes. Most employees would be concerned that abusive language may, be let, may lead to discipline, even though the manager didn't specifically threaten discipline. Was there an examination? Yes, the manager questioned the employee. By the way, you may have noticed that the manager called it a counseling session. However, because the manager asked questions and expected a response from the employee, it really wasn't a counseling session. Finally, did the employee request union representation? No. Therefore, the agency didn't violate the statute. Remember, in investigatory examinations, the employee gets to choose whether he or she wants the union involved. A nurse is called into the employee's supervisor's office and is asked to write out a statement explaining how the wrong medication was given to a patient. The employee requests union representation. The manager says no and directs her to prepare the report immediately. Was this a violation? Let's go through each one of the questions again. Is there an agency representative? Yes. Did the employee have a reasonable anticipation of discipline? Yes. Most employees would be concerned that giving a patient the wrong medicine may lead to discipline. Third, was there an examination? Yes. Even a request for a response in writing is an examination because the employee is giving information. Finally, did the employee request union representation? Yes. Therefore, the manager violated the statute. Here's another hypothetical. A manager calls an employee into his office to question him about a cash register shortage. The manager does not tell the employee that he actually believes that a different employee is responsible. And he is trying to get information from other employees just to confirm his belief. The manager denies the employee's request for union representation. Did the manager violate the statute?
Okay. First, is there an agency representative? Yes. Was there an examination? Yes, the manager questioned the employee. Did the employee have a reasonable anticipation of discipline? Probably yes. The manager may not think the employee stole the money, but the employee probably doesn't know that. The employee just knows that the supervisor is asking him questions about missing money. A reasonable employee likely would be concerned that they were being questioned because the manager thinks that he or she was guilty. Finally, did the employee request union representation? Yes. Therefore, in this case, the manager violated the statute. What should the agency do when an employee requests union representation during an investigatory examination? First, it can grant the request for representation. Second, it can discontinue the interview. Or third, it can offer the employee the chance between continuing the interview unaccompanied by a union representative or having no interview at all. What is the agency not allowed to do? It cannot tell the employee that getting the union involved will only cause more problems or otherwise try to coerce the employee not to get union representation. What about the union's rights to designate a representative? Generally, the union has the fundamental basic right to determine who it wants to represent the union or the employee in all matters. However, the agency also has an interest in making sure that it can conduct an investigation. So how does the authority balance that right? The authority, the authority usually finds that the union can designate whoever it wants to represent an employee during investigatory examinations, but there are a few very rare exceptions. First, an agency can refuse to allow a particular union representative if that particular representative has disrupted previous investigations. For example, in one case, the agency had a series of interviews with employees regarding a particular incident. The agency refused to allow a union representative to attend an investigatory interview because that particular union representative had interfered in previous investigatory interviews. The authority had he held that the agency did not violate the statute by refusing to allow that particular union representative. In another case, the authority held that the agency could refuse to allow the subject of an investigation to be the union representative for the witnesses. However, a witness can be the union representative for a different witness. It is very important to remember that if there is a special circumstance like we discussed above earlier, the agency must give the union an opportunity to designate a different union representative to attend the meeting. The authority has also found that the agency was not required to delay an investigation because, because a particular representative was off-site if another representative is readily available. However, that case had some very unique facts. The u two union officials could not attend the investigatory interviews because they were attending regional negotiations. The authority held that it was very important that the agency did not cause the union officials to be absent. The interviews and the regional negotiations had been scheduled far in advance, so the union officials knew about the conflict. Also, there was, no, there was no evidence that both union officials needed to attend the regional negotiations. Further, the union did not explain why two union officials were the only people that could represent the employee during the investigation. It is also important to note that the agency could have postponed the investigations without any negative impact. Nonetheless, the authority decided that the union did not justify why it needed the investigations postponed. Therefore, the agency did not violate the statute by refusing to delay the investigation. 
What can the union representative do during the meeting? The union representative has a right to take an active part in the meeting. This includes consulting with the employee, making statements that will be part of the record, suggesting other avenues of inquiry, and assisting the employee in presenting facts. However, the union representative can't interfere with the investigation by being verbally abusive or by directing the employee to lie or not respond to questions. Okay, so we've discussed wine gardens, we have our investigatory interviews, and we've discussed formal discussions. The final subject of this session is going to be bypasses. An agency bypasses the union when it deals directly with bargaining employees regarding conditions of employment. Bypasses are different from formal discussions and investigatory interviews. First, the statute does not specifically describe bypasses. Instead, the authority has found that the agency violates the duty to bargain in good faith, which is explicitly discussed in the statute, because the union represents the employees and the employees have a right to be represented by the union. The agency may not negotiate directly with employees. It must go through the union. Also, as we're, dis we're going to discuss a little later, bypasses often occur during meetings. In some cases, the agency can avoid bypassing the union by simply inviting the union to the meeting. However, in other cases, the agency can violate the statute even if the union attends the meeting. Remember, the, union, the agency can never negotiate with a bargaining employee. There are two distinct types of bypasses. The first type of bypass is when the agency discusses a grievance, disciplinary matter, or other general condition with an employee if that employee has specifically designated the union as his or her representative in that particular matter. This includes scheduling a grievance meeting directly with the employee, asking the employee questions about the grievance or disciplinary matter, or informing the employee that the grievance was filed improperly. These all must be done through the union. A bypass occurs even if the agency simply notifies the employee directly of a decision regarding a grievance, disciplinary matter, or other matters for, over which the union is representing the employee. That is called a McGuire bypass. The second type of bypass occurs when an agency negotiates directly with bargaining unit employees. This includes asking employees to agree or, or, agree, or agree to develop or agree to changes in their working conditions, implementing proposals developed by employees, or encouraging employees to put pressure on the union to take a particular course of action. A unique Factor, uh, a unique circumstance is when the agency wants to pull employees. The agency is permitted to gather information, including opinions, from employees to ensure the eff efficiency and effectiveness of the if its operations. However, the agency cannot use this information in an effort to try to negotiate or undermine the union. So what's the difference between collecting information and bypassing a union? The authority considers three questions. First, how was the information collected? Second, what information was collected? Third, how the information was used? Let's discuss some examples. A clinic director decides to hold extended hours one day a week. The clinic's director notifies the affected employees and asks them to decide how to rotate the extended hours each week. Did the agency bypass the union? The answer to this question is yes. The director allowed the employees to determine how to rotate the hours when it was the union's right to negotiate over this procedure. A supervisor has a meeting with a nursing assistant. 
During the meeting, the supervisor tells the nursing assistant that another employee has complained that the nursing assistant made inappropriate comments to her. Then the supervisor tells the nursing assistant that the complaint will probably go away if he agrees to work for a different department. The nursing assistant did not designate a union representative. Did the supervisor bypass the union? The answer is yes. The supervisor is essentially offering to settle a complaint by another employee. It does not matter that the employee did not request union representation. The union, not the employee, decides what it wants to negotiate. Here's another exercise. A supervisor proposes to suspend the employee for four days because the employee is repeatedly late for work. The union represents the employee during a meeting to discuss the proposed suspension. Several days later, the supervisor sends an email to the employee stating that he has decided to reprimand instead of suspend the employee. Has the supervisor bypassed the union? The answer is yes, the supervisor bypassed the union. The supervisor knew that the union was representing the employee in that particular matter. Nonetheless, he gives the decision to the employee, not the union. One more exercise. An agency decides to open a new satellite office. The agency notified the union that it wanted to survey the employees to see if they would be interested in transferring to the new office. It also asked the union for comments on the survey and the union did not object. The agency then sent the survey to employees. It did not ask the employees to provide opinions on how employees would be selected for the assignment. The agency also shared the results with the union and negotiated with the union. Did the agency bypass the union? The answer in this case was no, the agency, the agency did not bypass the union. And let's look at all the factors. First, the union was given advance notice and an opportunity to comment on the poll. The agency did not ask employees for their opinions on how to implement the change. The agency shared the results with the union and the agency negotiated with the union. So in this case, the authority found that the agency was not trying to go around the union and negotiate with the employees. This concludes the presentation on formal discussions, examinations, and bypasses. If you have any questions regarding this right or any other right under the statute, please contact your local regional office. You will find all the necessary contact information on our website under Office of General Counsel Regional Offices. You can also attend our training. The training schedule is on www.flra.gov under the Resources and Training tab. You can also schedule your own training by contacting the regional office nearest you. Finally, I would encourage all of you to complete a sur the survey on how you like this training module. There is a Take a Survey button at the end of this presentation.